The distinctive and unusual de Havilland Sea Vixen was a British-built carrier-based air defence fighter operated by the Royal Navy's Fleet Air Arm from the 1950s to the early 1970s, where she earned the distinction of being Britain's first two-seat combat supersonic aircraft. However, she also had a reputation for being a dangerous aircraft to fly. During her operational lifespan, many aircraft were lost in accidents and aircrew killed. She was also involved in one of the largest loss of life at an air show. However, the Sea Vixen is remembered for her significant position in aviation history when she was the critical component in Britain's golden age of naval air power. After the Second World War, the Royal Navy considered the de Havilland Vampire as a seagoing fighter after proving carrier operations were feasible when a vampire made the world's first carrier jet landing and takeoff in December 1945 from HMS Ocean. These carrier trials opened discussions between the Admiralty and de Havilland regarding the requirements for a twin-engine jet, all-weather, swept-wing fighter with a crew of two, one pilot and another to manage the radar and navigation equipment. These talks resulted in specification N.40-46 being created. At the same time, the RAF was also considering plans for radar-equipped all-weather fighters for its frontline squadrons, and in 1947, they issued specification F-44-46, which surprisingly called for much the same type of fighter aircraft as the fleet air arm was looking for. Since the two specifications were so similar, de Havilland decided to submit one design, named the DH-110, to cover the requirements of both services. Drawing on the twin boom tail layout of the de Havilland Vampire and Venom for inspiration, they designed an all-metal structure with 40 degree swept wings, allowing the DH-110 to become supersonic in a shallow dive, marking it as the first British two-seat combat aircraft to do so. However, the type was subsonic in service. Adopting the twin boom tail reduced the aircraft's length and height, optimizing stowage space and headroom aboard aircraft carriers. To reduce asymmetric handling problems and to increase safety over the ocean in the event of an engine failure, a pair of Rolls-Royce Avon RA3 turbojets, each capable of producing 6,500 pounds of thrust, were installed side by side in the fuselage. Initially, the RAF demonstrated the most interest in the DH-110 to fulfill specification F-44-46. In 1949, the Ministry of Supply ordered nine prototypes, seven to be night fighters and two long-range fighters. However, the RAF only did so as insurance against the failure of the Gloucester GH-5, later to become the Javelin, of which they had ordered four prototypes. At the same time, the Ministry of Supply placed an order for four prototypes for the Royal Navy, which was later cancelled in the year due to economic factors when it was decided that the cheaper option would be an improved version of the de Havilland DH-112 Sea Venom, which was considered lower risk and available sooner, instead of the more expensive and unproven DH-110. At the same time, the RAF were also concerned that the DH-110 would be delayed, so they started looking around for less risky alternatives, and went for a mixture of meteors, venoms, and vampires as interim night fighters. So the initial order of nine prototypes was reduced to five DH-110s. But, as fate would have it, Gloucester got their GA-5 in the air first, and in July 1952, the Ministry of Supply announced that the Gloucester Javelin would be the preferred choice, and the RAF interest in the DH-110 ended. Despite all the setbacks, De Havilland persisted with DH-110 development, aiming to regain official interest in the type. This resulted in the maiden flight, which lasted 46 minutes and was piloted by the legendary John Cat's Eyes Cunningham of the initial prototype WG-236, powered by a pair of Rolls-Royce Avian RA-7 turbojet engines on September 26, 1951. I hope you're enjoying this video as much as I've enjoyed making it. A lot of time and effort went into researching this video, and I'd appreciate it if you could take a moment to hit the like button to feed the YouTube algorithm. This helps the channel grow and reach more people, and perhaps you'll consider subscribing for more aviation content. Now, back to the video. However, tragedy struck almost one year after her maiden flight, 
when the prototype DH110WG236 was being displayed at the Farnborough Air Show on the 6th of September 1952 by pilot John Derry and flight test observer Anthony Richards. The planned demonstration of the DH-110 was nearly cancelled when the aircraft of Fembra, de Havilland's second DH-110 prototype, WG-240, an all-black night fighter, became unserviceable. Not wanting to disappoint the crowds, Derry and Richards went to de Havilland's factory in Hatfield, collected the first DH-110 prototype, WG-236, and flew it to Fembra to begin their display at around 3.45pm. As part of the display routine, Derry was coming out of a final loop of its display. As he straightened up the aircraft at about 520 miles an hour, he pulled into a climb. The combination of the aerodynamic loads on the, air on the airframe structure designed for subsonic flight, in this case the wing structure used for the vampire and venom, proved incapable of sustaining the forces from a dive followed by a rolling pullout. The outer wings detached from the aircraft, and the rest of the plane broke apart mid-air tearing off the cockpit section, the engines, and the tailplane. The cockpit, with the two crew members still inside, fell right in front of the spectators, nearest the runway. Injuring several people, however, the engines travelled much further on a ballistic trajectory. Although one engine missed the crowds entirely, the second one ploughed into the spectators watching the air show from Observation Hill. Richard Gardner, then five years old, he recalled the day in years later. I'll never forget it. It looked like confetti. It looked like silver confetti. The remaining airframe floated down right in front of us. It just came down like a leaf. And then the two engines, like two missiles, shot out of the airframe and hurtled into the direction of the airshow. There was a short sort of silence. Then people, one or two people, screamed. But mostly it was just a sort of shock. You could hear some people sort of whimpering, which was quite shocking. The incident led to a restructuring of safety regulations for airshows in the UK, and no member of the public died as a result of a British airshow flight for more than 62 years, until the crash of a Hawker Hunter killed 11 people during the Shoreham Air Show on the 22nd of August 2015. It took 69 years for the casualties to be commemorated, a memorial consisting of 32 bricks inscribed with the names of the airshow and its 31 casualties was unveiled at the Farnborough Air Science Museum on the 6th of September 2021. Following the loss of the initial prototype, the DH-110 was grounded as investigators established the cause of the crash. This led to de Havilland modifying WG-240, the second prototype, by reinforcing the outboard wings, adding a second skin to the leading edges, and introducing an all-moving tailplane. WG-240 didn't resume flight testing until the spring of 1953. With the crash at Farnborough, the DH-110's future did not look promising. However, a lucky break would come for the aircraft when the DH-116 project Essentially, a swept wing sea venom was cancelled. De Havilland dropped the DH-116 when the Royal Navy changed their design requirement for the aircraft, but offered the Navy a thoroughly updated and fully navalized version of the DH-110, which was the WG-240 with the more powerful Avon engines. Between 1953 and 1954, development continued with an order for a semi-navalized DH-110, prototype Mark 20X, XF828, powered by two Rolls-Royce Avon 208 turbojets. XF828 hosted various modifications from the original DH-110 airframes, including changes to the wing, leading edge profile, wing strengthening, underwing fixture points for catapult launches, tail hook for arrested landings, and a long stroke undercarriage. However, it lacked a wing folding mechanism and radar. On the 20th of June 1955, XF-828 conducted its inaugural flight from the de Havilland's facility at Christchurch Airfield in Dorset. The subsequent year, XF-828 completed its first arrested deck landing on the Royal Navy's aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal. XF-828's sad fate awaited her after she completed the flight test programs. She was sent to the School of Aircraft Handling at Kuldros, where her wings were removed and used for fire drills until she was finally destroyed in 1970. 
By the end of 1954, de Havilland, having finalised production drawings, was given the green light to start work on an entirely naval DH-110, which was to become the Sea Vixen. The designs were an 80% redesign of the original DH-110 prototypes. They featured powered folding wing system, reinforced landing gear capable of withstanding the additional stresses of carrier landings, a steerable nose wheel, a revised tail unit, and a redesigned fuselage to accommodate armament. In 1955, de Havilland was awarded a contract for 78 aircraft, of which a total of 119 FAW-1s would be built. On March 5, 1957, the DH-110 was officially designated Sea Vixen FAW Mark 20, which stood for Fighter All Weather, later redesignated FAW-1. The first production aircraft, XJ-474, came out of the factory and undertook a maiden flight on March 20th. Two Rolls-Royce Avon Mark 208 turbojets provided power, now accessible via a top hatch to simplify maintenance. The Avons gave the FAW-1 a top speed of around 645 miles an hour at 10,000 feet and a surface ceiling of 48,000 feet. The range on internal fuel was 600 miles and the all-up maximum weight was 35,000 pounds. In November 1957, the first FAW-1 was delivered to 700Y Squadron, forming a trials unit and testing eight FAW-1s until the unit was recommissioned to 892 Squadron. This aircraft promptly engaged in clearance trials, particularly addressing handling issues. The second production aircraft was utilized for engineering trials, and the third for radar trials. On the 2nd of July 1959, despite the delays and prolonged development phase, the Navy finally got its most potent all-weather interceptor ground attack aircraft when 892 Squadron at Yeovilton became the first Sea Vixen equipped squadron. In time, all the former Sea Venom squadrons were re-equipped with a new fighter, and soon the 766 Naval Air Fighter School, 890, 893 and 899 squadrons were flying the powerful interceptor. The Sea Vixen accommodated a two-person crew, consisting of a pilot and a radar operator. The pilot's canopy was offset to the left side of the fuselage, which gave the Sea Vixen its unusual appearance. However, it also allows for better visibility when performing carrier landings. The other odd feature is the radar operator's position, accessed through a top hatch and situated deep within the fuselage of the right side, known as the coal hole. Because there was almost no view out, this arrangement was not popular. The coal hole position was designed to enhance the dimness of the early radar imagery. The observer had the tricky job of steering the radar and using his twin radar screens to figure out where the target was and direct the pilot to follow a course leading to an interception. The radar's look-down performance was non-existent, so the aircraft had to fly lower than the intended target. Tricky if the target was at a low level, hugging the deck. The type's secondary task of ground attack swapped the crew's roles somewhat. The pilot now handled much of the work, and the observer was reduced to calling out speed and altitude, particularly in a dive attack when the pilot's attention was on the gun side. The pilot's right thigh was within reach of the observer, and a jab with a suitable pointy object was a valuable backup to ensure a dive was pulled out of in time. The Sea Vixen FAW-1 could be equipped with two microcell 2-inch rocket packs housed in two retractable fuselage containers, four Firestreak infrared air-to-air -air missiles, and four 500-pound bombs. The DH-110 design proposed to the RAF was initially designed to be equipped with four 30mm Aden cannons. However, upon its introduction, the Sea Vixen was the first British aircraft solely armed with missiles, rockets, and bombs. This marked a departure from conventional gun armament typically seen in fighters and many air crews lamented the absence of guns. Beyond its primary role in fleet defense, the Sea Vixen was also used in ground attack missions. For these missions, it could carry microcell unguided 2-inch rocket packs, either four 500-pound or two 1,000-pound bombs, and later two AGM-12 bullpup air-to-ground missiles. In extreme operational scenarios, the Sea Vixen FAW-1 was authorized to carry the Red Beard Freefall Tactical Nuclear Bomb. further development by the 1960s, de Havilland had progressed to an enhanced version, designated as the Sea Vixen FAW-2. 
outfitted with modern radar and red top air to air missiles as its primary ar armament. Concept of integrating an ar aircraft into a weapon system had become prevalent, where sensors like radar would be closely linked to navigation and weapon systems. De Havilland incorporated this concept into the Sea Vixen's design. According to aviation author David Hobbs, it was the first British fighter aircraft to be designed in this manner. The FAW-2 variant could carry the same types of armament as the FAW-1, except it could also carry four advanced red-top infrared air-to-air -air missiles, all controlled by the Ferranti pilot attack site. The Red Top missiles possessed an all-aspect capability, with acquisition facilitated by slaving their homing head to the airborne interception or AI-18 radar operated by the observer. This meant that they could be fired against a head-on target. These missiles were designed to home on heat sources, generated by kinetic heating from fast-approaching supersonic targets like the Tupel of Tu-22 blinder bomber. Integration of the Red Top system into the AI-18 radar allowed for enhanced functionality. In 1969, the Sea Vixen FAW-2 engaged in intercept practices against supersonic targets, including Concorde and flight tests conducted over the Irish Sea. The FAW-2's enlarged tail boom carried additional fuel tanks in the pinion extensions above and ahead of the wing leading edge. Furthermore, it featured an upgraded escape system and extra space for electronic countermeasure equipment. However, the aerodynamic alterations rendered it incapable of carrying the 1,000 pound bomb. Visually, the FAW-1 and FAW-2 could be distinguished by the forward extending tail booms over the wing leading edges of the FAW-2. The FAW-2 series were also powered by two Rolls-Royce Avon Mark 208 turbojets, which gave the FAW-2 a top speed of around 640 miles an hour at 10,000 feet, with a service ceiling of 48,000 feet, with a range on the internal fuel of 700 miles. To extend its operational range, the Sea Vixen was equipped with a refueling probe for aerial refueling from tanker aircraft. It could also serve as a tanker for refueling other aircraft, enabling a Sea Vixen tanker to refuel another by the buddy system through two 150 Imperial gallon drop tanks. 59 FAW-1 types were converted to FAW-2 specifications, which presented maintenance compatibility problems. However, the broader view of the Vixen is that the Navy largely managed to make a silk purse out of a pig's ear. Operational history during its time with the Fleet Air Arm, the aircraft didn't engage in direct warfare, but did participate in various operations. In 1961, when President Abdul Karim Qasem of Iraq threatened to annex Kuwait, the UK deployed fleet carriers to the region. Sea vixens from these carriers conducted patrols, deterring Qasem's aggression and averting a conflict over Kuwait. In January 1964, unrest erupted in Tanganyika when the first and second Tanganyika rifles mutinied against British officers and NCOs. The UK responded by sending HMS Centaur and 45 Commandos, Royal Marines. Sea Vixens supported by the Royal Marines operations, restoring stability to Tanganyika. That same year, Sea Vixens from HMS Centaur were deployed once more to the Persian Gulf, conducting airstrikes against rebel forces in support of British troops facing unruly local dissents. Later, in 1964, Sea Vixens from HMS Centaur's 892 Squadron, stationed near Indonesia, helped prevent escalation during President Sukarno's Indonesia-Malaysian conflict. During the 1960s, Sea Vixens continued their service, contributing to the Berea Patrol, which prevented oil from reaching Rhodesia through Mozambique. They were also deployed in the Far East. In 1967, in the Persian Gulf, Sea Vixens covered the withdrawal from Aden alongside several Royal Navy vessels, including HMS Albion, HMS Bulwark, HMS Eagle, carrying the Sea Vixens, and HMS Fearless, an LPD, or Loading Platform Dock. Facing faster supersonic fighters like the BAC Lightning and Dassault Mirage III, the Sea Vixen employed tactics of persistent maneuvering until its adversaries depleted their fuel, seizing the opportunity to strike with the Red Top missile when they attempted to disengage using afterburners. Additionally, the Sea Vixen showcased its agility in aerobatic displays. As part of two Royal Navy demonstration teams, 
Simon's Circus, and Fred's Five. While short-lived, with only around 40 displays put on, Simon's Circus was regarded by many as one of the best air display teams ever. Flying any carrier aircraft is dangerous. The Sea Vixen was no different. And the unforgiving environment often meant that malfunctions turned into fatal accidents in the blink of an eye. Between 1962 and 1970, no fewer than 51 aircrew were killed in 30 accidents, all casualties of a cold war that so many think was bloodless. The aircraft's rugged construction saved it from destruction on many occasions, most famously when a deck landing went wrong, which caused one Sea Vixen to hit several parked aircraft and other deck clutter. Then, staggering back into the air, the Sea Vixen landed safely after diverting to a shore base minus about 8 feet off the starboard wing. Of the 148 Sea Vixens built, 55 were lost in accidents, along with two DH-110 development prototypes. This loss rate amounted to nearly 37%, with 30, 54% incidents relating in fatalities. In 1972, the last Sea Vixen squadron was disbanded. Many considered this retirement premature. The Airframes had many years of life left in them, though their weapon systems were becoming increasingly outdated. In total, 29 FAW-2s were manufactured, accompanied by 67 FAW-1s that underwent rebuilding and upgrading to the FAW-2 standard. The last FAW-1 model came off the line in 1962 and started to be phased out in 1966, Vixen FAW-2 ending in 1972. The Admiralty initially intended to replace the Sea Vixen with the McDonnell Douglas Phantom FG-1. Plans were made to retrofit the aircraft carriers HMS Ark, Royal and Eagle to accommodate and operate these new fighters. However, due to defence budget reductions and the decommissioning of HMS Eagle, only HMS Ark Royal underwent the necessary conversion work to deploy the new Phantom FG-1. Following their retirement from frontline service, many FAW-1 and FAW-2s were broken up and scrapped. But rather than scrapping them, the Ministry of Defence considered other uses for them. A few earlier airframes had been sent off to ground instructional schools. A few Sea Vixens were repurposed as drones, leading to their redesignation as the Sea Vixen D3. Although only four of these aircraft were officially converted to the D3 standard, three additional planes were slated for conversion of Farnborough, but ultimately remained unchanged. These were originally meant to be drones with missiles fired at them, but they were far too expensive for such a job, and ended up being used to train drone pilots in the techniques of flying an aircraft by remote control. Additionally, two other FAW-2 Sea Vixens were transformed into target tugs and redesignated as Sea Vixen TT-2. Before the drone program was discontinued, XP-924, now designated GCVIX, the sole remaining Sea Vixen in flying condition, was restored to its original 899 NAS colours. Previously owned and operated by de Havilland Aviation, GCVIX was often displayed at their hangar at Bournemouth Airport in Dorset and air shows across the UK. It was the most complex civilian operated type on the UK register until Vulcan XH558 returned to the air. Following an investigation by the Air Accident Investigation Branch into damage sustained by GCVIX during a landing at Bournemouth on April 5th, 2012, the aircraft was transferred to Naval Aviation Limited, a subsidiary of the Fly Navy Heritage Trust, on September 16th, 2014, and is now stationed at the Royal Naval Air Station at Yeovilton in Somerset. A fine example of the FAW-2 can be seen at the Midland Air Museum, Coventry Airport in the UK. The museum acquired FAW-2 XN685 in 1992 and recently restored it is well worth a visit.